Hi everyone, thank you for your feedback on last week's first wellbeing series video and for continuing to send me your questions. I've had quite a few that have centred around the same topic, so this week I'll be discussing how to eat well during this period of time that's seeing so much disruption to many of our lives. So I think I probably need to start off by addressing exactly what it means to eat healthily. I am a nutritionist by trade and nutrition and relationships with food is something that I feel very passionately about and could talk about for hours. I won't, but anyone who's ever spoken to me on this subject will be able to tell you that my philosophy is that food is not something to be feared or conquered. Eating is not a problem that needs to be solved. And I think all too often when we speak about nutrition or eating well or healthy diets, what we're really talking about is weight, weight loss or weight gain, when actually that's a really tiny part of the picture. And a lot of anxiety seems to be emerging at the moment about the thought of being stuck at home in close proximity to the fridge and kitchen cupboards with not a lot else to do except eat. And it's really sad that this is causing additional stress for people during what is already a really difficult time. So if you're feeling that way, and even if you're not, hopefully I can provide some thoughts on how you can eat healthily and happily as we navigate this extraordinary time. So people have always now, but more than ever, used food as a way to connect with their family and their loved ones. It's one of the most fundamental ways that we show love to the people we care about, whether it's delivering groceries or meals to people who aren't able to get their own food, or sitting down as a family for a meal, or baking with the kids. Eating well is one of the cornerstones of well-being, but it boils down to so much more than counting calories or macronutrients or the impact of our diets on the way our bodies look. And that's unfortunately what most of the conversations around nutrition seem to focus on. Our diet and the way that we eat impact profoundly on our physical and our mental health. And these are the two things that we're striving to take extra good care of at the moment. And I should say that if you do have, have aesthetic goals, that's obviously completely fine. But people strive for perfection in their diets when actually the data suggests that the majority of people aren't even getting the basics right. So only around 20% of UK adults are getting enough fibre and the same figure applies for the number of people getting their five a day fruit and veg servings. And most of us are eating more than double the amount of added sugar that we should be. So one of my best tips that I will constantly give to anybody looking to change their diet is to think about what you can put in rather than what you can take away. So often when we look at trying to eat more healthily, we just think about what we need to remove. No more chocolate, no more biscuits, no more crisps, no more bread or whatever. But can you change that mindset? During this time when we're spending more time in the home and we perhaps have more time to think about and prepare our meals, can you be trying to include more fruit and veg? Can you be including more whole grain carbohydrates? Can you be trying to increase your fibre intake or your water intake? I find that firstly, approaching your eating habits from a positive mindset rather than a negative one sets the tone that healthy eating is something to be enjoyed and relished rather than a chore or a punishment. And secondly, if you are focusing on what you can be adding in, you will find that those healthier elements do start to replace the less nutrient dense ones uh, and perhaps those more calorie heavy foods as a matter of course without you having to actually actively restrict yourself. And one way that you can put this into practice quite consciously is a tip that I give out frequently. So if you're thinking that you really fancy some chocolate or some biscuits or whatever your snack of choice is, give yourself permission to eat that thing, but make a deal with yourself that you're going to eat a bowl of fruit first. Because that act of washing, preparing and eating fruit stretches out some time for that craving to pass and to fill your tummy with a high volume of healthy food that's going to help you feel fuller and you get all of the lovely nutrients that come along with it. It's a win-win. And the thing is, after you're done, you might feel that you still want the chocolate and that's OK. And these foods are here for us to enjoy. There is no such thing as a bad food. We just have to give some thoughts the proportions in which we eat them. So how else can we try and ensure we're eating well during this time? Obviously, many of us are experiencing big changes to our normal routines and you can try and retain a sense of normality by eating according to your normal meal pattern, whatever that looks like, because there is no one right way to eat. It might be three square meals a day or something different, whatever works for you. But retaining that routine and putting effort into making sure you're having full nutritious meals rather than just snacky bits is going to help you avoid that situation where you're constantly grazing on less healthy things or where you don't eat for hours and end up having a big high sugar, high fat calorie dense meal because you're really hungry and your hormones are going crazy telling you that you need to eat. 
And this might take a bit of planning. Obviously, the responsible thing for us to be doing at the moment is minimising the amount of trips that we take to go and buy groceries. And that can be quite an adjustment when you're used to being able to just nip into a shop whenever you fancy to pick up whatever you want to eat at that exact moment. So think about what meals and snacks you want to eat for the week ahead. Make a list of everything that you need to be able to cook them and shop accordingly. Um, and obviously, I should say, if you are self-isolating or shielding, please ensure that somebody else is getting or delivering your food for you. And you might want to do some batch cooking, maybe freeze some meals to eat at a later date to help you get the most out of your fresh and perishable ingredients and avoid food waste. So we can learn to be a bit more methodical in our approach to cooking and eating. But emotionally driven eating behaviour is a very common thing. Comfort eating, stress eating, even boredom eating. Um, these are all very common behaviours and probably something that we're going to be seeing a lot more of at the moment. And emotional eating isn't something that you should feel badly about. As I said, it's a very common reaction to negative emotions. But you can try to become aware if it's a habit of yours and in response, make an effort to practice eating mindfully. So mindful eating is about being present when you eat, paying attention to the experience and avoiding distractions. Those are both internal and external. And some ways to approach mindful eating include giving yourself proper space and time to eat rather than being on the go or eating while you're at your desk working. Um, it can be ensuring that you're focusing on your food rather than scrolling through your phone or watching TV. It can be trying to eat slowly, making sure you're chewing your food fully and savouring it, engaging all of your senses, um, really recognising the different sensations involved in your meal. And it can be acknowledging and acting on the feelings that you experience when you're eating. For example, making sure that you start eating when you're hungry and stopping when you start to feel full, rather than because you've decided you're only going to eat a certain amount or because you feel you need to clear your plate. And there's lots of literature available on mindful eating. And to be honest, most of us could benefit from making an effort to eat more mindfully, whether emotional eating is a frequent habit of ours or not. So I made a point in last week's video about making sure you get information from reputable sources. And this goes double, triple, quadruple for this topic. There is no end of complete nonsense about nutrition and diet out there in magazines, um, TV, on social media, from celebrities and influencers. I could do an hour's rant on this topic alone. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on it, actually, but I'll keep it to this. Please, please, please seek out your nutritional advice from qualified sources. And that means bodies like the NHS, the World Health Organization, the British Dietetic Association, the British Nutrition Foundation, and people like qualified dietitians and registered nutritionists. Unfortunately, nutritionist is not a protected title in the UK, which is how you end up with people calling themselves nutritionists after they've done a one day online course or something similar. Checking out your experts' qualifications and the professional organisations that they're registered with will help to keep you safe. And that guides me on nicely to supplementation. Unfortunately, crises such as the one we find ourselves in with coronavirus are often exploited by people who capitalise on the fear of others to try and sell them something that they say will protect them. I've seen a lot of adverts for vitamin supplements or diet hacks that will allegedly boost your immune system and protect you from coronavirus. OK, so big myth to bust here. There is no such thing as boosting your immune system. No specific food, nutrient supplement or anything is going to protect you from catching, catching a virus if you've been exposed to it. The claims that companies are allowed to make about foods and food related supplements are very tightly relate, regulated. And the European Food Safety Authority have not authorised any claim for a food or food component in the UK to be labelled as protecting against infection. So if you come across anyone claiming the opposite, they are either a big liar or woefully misinformed. But either way, you shouldn't be listening to them and you definitely should not be buying what they're selling. So you can't boost your immune system, but what you can do is support it by doing all of the things we know are good for our well-being. Sleeping enough, exercising regularly and yes, eating a healthy, balanced diet that has a variety of different foods in it. And the reason why we focus on our balance and our variety in particular is because different food contain all different micronutrients, our vitamins and minerals, and they contain them in varying levels. And all of them play a part in keeping us healthy. So we want to make sure we're getting lots of different foods in a good balance rather than relying on specific food or foods, because that variety means that we're hitting all of those many different micronutrients that we need. And for most people, it is possible to get all of the nutrients that you need from food. 
with one exception, which I will talk about in a moment. And there are people who will have vitamin and mineral deficiencies that can be due to health conditions or absorption problems or many other reasons. And those people will need to take supplements and they absolutely should if they've been advised to by their doctor or their healthcare professional. But most healthy people can get everything they need from a well-planned, balanced diet, meaning that by and large, supplementation with vitamins and other pills just isn't necessary and you can save yourself some money. Now, I mentioned that there is an exception to that rule, and those of you who've done an MOT health check with me will know that I am all about vitamin D. So unlike all of the other vitamins and minerals which we get from our food, most of our vitamin D comes from sunlight exposure. Our skin has a mechanism in it that synthesizes vitamin D from UVB rays from the sun and turns it into vitamin D that we can use in the body. So we do get some vitamin D from food, from animal products like meat, fish and eggs, but we can't get as much as we need. So topping up with sunlight exposure is critical. Now, in the UK, during the autumn and the winter months, the sun actually isn't in the right position in the sky for us to be able to absorb that UVB ray. So the advice is to take a daily vitamin D supplement, certainly during the winter months, if not all year round. Um, however, a lot of us will be going, are going to be going outside less frequently than we normally would at the moment and therefore getting less sun exposure. So if you're not already, you may want to consider taking a supplement and you want to make sure that what you're taking has at least 10 micrograms of vitamin D in it and that you take it with something containing fat. And this is because vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, so it needs to attach to fat molecules in food in order to be absorbed into the body. So you don't have to eat a super fatty meal or anything like that. Just something that has a small amount of fat will do. Uh, basically, don't take it on an empty stomach or you won't see the benefit. And as kind of a final side note to eating well, please ensure that you are drinking enough water and staying hydrated. You can monitor your hydration by paying attention to your thirst levels. Ideally, you don't want to wait until you become thirsty before you drink some water. Uh, you can pay attention to the colour of your pee. You want it to be a light yellow colour. Anything darker than that indicates that you are dehydrated. And then other signs of dehydration are things like dry lips and mouth, um, feeling fatigued and having a headache. And hydration is something to be mindful of as the weather starts to get warmer and staying hydrated is especially important if you get poorly or if you're experiencing some of the symptoms that are being associated with coronavirus. So uh, the high temperature, for example, and something that it's really good to be aware of as well is that thirst and hunger signals are processed by the same area of the brain, which means that they can sometimes get confused and we end up interpreting our thirst as hunger, which is what can lead to those cravings for higher fat, higher calorie, higher sugar snacks. So make sure that you're sipping water regularly throughout the day and that will help you to avoid that. So uh, wishing you all the happiest of Easter's if you're celebrating. Hope you enjoy the bank holiday weekend and eat all of your Easter eggs entirely guilt free. If you'd like more information on healthy eating, the group Healthy Eating and Activity Statement has lots of good info in there. If you don't have a copy, just let me know and I will happily share it with you. Um, otherwise, feel free to contact me with any questions uh, about the content of this video and let me know what you'd like to talk about in episode three. Thank you.